Well, good evening, everyone. Happy Sabbath, and welcome to our Friday night study. Of course, I know it's Sabbath morning some places in the world, quite early. Um, and we're going to continue reading from 1888, re-examined by Wieland and Short. It was written in 1987, published in 1987, originally written before and edited and put out again just in for the anniversary of 1888. Um, and it's an extremely good document, though there are things that they couldn't possibly have seen. And this section here is, is speaks more to us than it did to them. And so before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful that we can be here uh, together, meeting on the internet, uh, to study. We're thankful for each of the people who have been uh, participating in the studies and sharing, and um, the people online who've been making comments. And um, we are thankful, Lord, for the way your Holy Spirit uh, guides and directs uh, the topics of study and how they interweave with each other, the different um, people who are leading out. We know that tomorrow Dwight and Stephen have presentations, and we know, Lord, that you will guide, and there will be see things seen in those presentations that will help us. We pray for one another, Lord. We need your angels around us. We need your Holy Spirit speaking to us. And we need you in the trials that we face each day, Sometimes they're small trials, but some, and sometimes they're big, but every trial is given through Christ uh, to bring us closer to him. And so we just ask, Lord, that we can endure uh, these trials, that we can cling to you and trust in you in spite of how we feel. Be with us now uh, as we open your word together. May your Holy Spirit teach us and lead and guide in our thoughts, in our conversation, that your name may be glorified. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, happy Sabbath again, everyone. So this section here, the light of 1888, the beginning of greater light. Now, a lot of what we've seen before was really necessary to understand this point. But I don't, and I don't think that uh, Wieland and Short really grasp the, this statement that we're going to read from the Spirit of Prophecy, uh, from Review and Herald, um, and two different quotes from Review and Herald, one from December 23rd, 1890, one from July 26th, 1892, and, and then further on other things that we're going to read. But we're going to start reading and we're going to discuss this. So they say, Ellen White often spoke of the certainty of the Lord sending new light if and when his people were willing to receive it. The tragic of if and when are necessary only because the new wine must have new bottles. And that means the crucifixion of self. So how does light come to us? Because God's going to send us new light, right? We, we pray for that. The latter rain, um, you know, message, the three angels message, all these different things that we see. We pray for the Holy Spirit, right? But how does light come to us? Now, there's sort of a mixing of the metaphors here because we're talking about new light and we're talking about new wine, right? So those are two different metaphors. Um, so new wine must have new bottles. The crucifixion of self. Right, so the crucifixion of self, yeah. So in order for us to have new light, we have to walk in the light that we have, right? That's the basic idea of new light. The reason why you need new light is the old light brings you so far and new light continues to lead you along the path. Now, we know that the new light comes from um, an appreciation of old truths. Right? So new light does not, it's not disconnected from from old light. It's actually an unfolding of it. Now, this idea that we need new bottles, well, of course, this comes from the scripture. You don't put new wine in old bottles, right? 
You don't put new cloth on an old garment. And you don't put brand new parts on a beat up old rusty truck. You know, you try to get some used parts, right? Because uh, it's just a waste of money. But anyway, here we know that we new wine. So new wine is new life. Just wine represents teaching or doctrine. And but there's a new bottles. And so it's the reception of new light that is necessary in order to receive new light. That is, you have to walk in the light. God's word is a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. God's word is as a shining light that shineth more and more unto a perfect day, right? So we, there's this advancing light. We don't know all these types of metaphors. But the idea that it means crucifixion of self, and now he's going to refer us to Matthew 9, verse 16 and 17. So, of course, that's just going to be um, what he's referring to. Um, no man putteth a piece of new cloth in an old garment for that which is put in to fill it up, taketh from the garment and rent is made and the rent is made worse. Neither do, do men put new wine into old bottles, else the bottles break and the wine runneth out and the bottles perish. <coughs> but they put new wine into new bottles and both are preserved. If God gave us light and we're not able to receive it, what happens to us? Does that light benefit us? You say if we're not able to receive it? We're not able to receive it. So we have new light, but we're not we're not receiving it. Like we're not prepared to receive it. So if if we are an old bottle and new light comes, the bottles are burst, right? So one of the things about new light is people want to have new light for various reasons, but they're unable to receive that light. Because they're not walking in the light that they have. So they're not asking for the old paths. Yeah, so they're going to reject it, right? You know, new light comes to them, and if you're not willing to receive it, then that light is actually going to condemn you, right? Light comes and has come to the world, and men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. And and that, that light then becomes a judgment against them, right? So we need to be willing to receive new light, which means we have to be obedient to the light that we have if we are going to receive new light. So we have this statement, from, two statements here from the spirit of prophecy. If through the grace of Christ, his people will become new bottles, he will fill them with new wine. God will give additional light and all truths will be recovered and replaced in the framework of truth. And wherever the laborers go, they will triumph. As God's ambassadors, they are to search the scriptures, to seek for the truths that have been hidden beneath the rubbish of error. Now, in the context here, because we don't we don't have the context right now, but if, if, if we were to look at this in the spirit of prophecy, which I'm going to go to right now, this is not talking about uh, the other churches. This is talking about God's ambassadors, right? Those who are to be as ambassadors. This is us. So I'm just trying to find this article. Let's take a second here. So this was December 23rd, 1890. And it doesn't give us a paragraph. It doesn't tell us there's two articles, actually, on December 23rd, 1890. So I'll just have to do this. So this is uh, the second article called Be Zealous, Therefore, and Repent. So here's what she's going to say. I'm going to switch the screen so you can get more of this context. The end is near. So that's that thing that people put on the little signs on the street corners, right? With the exclamation mark. We have not a moment to lose. Light is to shine forth from God's people in clear, distinct rays, bringing Jesus before the churches and before the world. Our work is not to be restricted to those who already know the truth. Our field is the world. The instrumentalities to be used are those souls who gladly receive the light of truth, which God communicates to them. These are God's agencies for communicating the knowledge of truth to the world. 
if through the grace of Christ, his people will become new bottles, right? So this is not about the world becoming new bottles, right? This is his people becoming new bottles. He will fill them with new wine. Now, this is not meant to be a criticism of the churches, but would most Adventists be looking to receive new wine? Well, most of them say there's no new light. Most of them will say there's no new light. Yeah, so people aren't really willing to receive new light. Something they haven't heard before, they're very cautious about, right? Now, of course, we have a whole bunch of people that are willing to receive all kinds of new light in a pretense of going back to the pioneers, to the foundation of this message. You know, the anti-Trinitarians, for instance. Not saying that, you know, Trinitarianism is correct, but in order to, to try to recover old light, they actually bring in what I would call strange fire. So they're not, they're not really understanding it. Of course, we have, you know, feast keeping, we have lunar Sabbaths, we have the character of God, et cetera, et cetera. There's all kinds of, of errors that come in. And, and all of these errors have a characteristic that they receive, they reject the spirit of prophecy. Right? So in order to receive this new doctrine, we have to reject actually light that has come to us. So people will say, well, Ellen White didn't understand about feast keeping. She hinted at it, but, you know, she, she says there's going to be new light, right? So some people say there's going to be new light, but the new light that they, they have actually contradicts old light. So it can't be new light, right? Okay. So I know I didn't say that all the best way to say it, but so we need to uh, become new bottles to be filled with this new wine. God will give additional light and old truths will be recovered and replaced in the framework of truth. Now, there is a framework of truth. So one of the things that this movement has been able to do that I have never seen any other movement do is recover old truths and replace them in the framework of truth. The 2520. We can see that that was part of that framework of truth. It was a truth that needed to be recovered and was replaced, right? So we've replaced it. And that's, that's new light, right? There's new light in understanding the 2520, isn't there? Yeah. That's where you know, discover, those, discovered a lot of different things with that. Yeah. Well, I mean, it unlocks Millerite history because we have to, we have to really dig. Right to understand this, and wherever the laborers go, they will triumph. Now, now we could look at this right now in the context of what this movement is is doing, and say, well, maybe maybe this is a new light because where the laborers are going, there isn't really triumph. We're not triumphing it at this point, but we're still in this process of understanding this light as Christ. Ambassadors, they are to search the scriptures, to seek for the truths that have been hidden beneath the rubbish of error, and every ray of light received is to be communicated to others. One interest will prevail, one subject will swallow up every other, Christ our righteousness. So when they focus upon this statement, um, what they are focusing upon is the new light in relation to Righteousness by faith. That's that's why they're um, interested in this quote, even though they don't finish the quote in the uh, which which I thought was kind of odd that they didn't finish the quote because uh, you know they might have just trimmed it down at some point. So the the, the next one is um, from July twenty sixth, eighteen ninety two, reviewing the quote. A great work is to be done, and God sees that our leading men have need of greater light that they might unite harmoniously with the messengers whom he will send to accomplish the work that he designs they should. 
So what were the leading men supposed to do? What did they need in order for a greater work to be done? A great work to be done. What do our leading men need? So what should the church be looking for? According to this quote, what should our leaders, our church be looking for? In order to accomplish a recovering light. Yeah, they need greater light, right? Is the church looking for greater light at the present time? It hasn't been looking for greater light for a while. It's sort of like we have the light we need. You know, we just need to accomplish the work that was given to us. But in order for that work to be done, we actually, the leading men need greater light. And the reason they need this is that they are to unite harmoniously with the messengers whom he will send to accomplish the work that he designs they should. So is the leadership looking to unite with messengers that God will send? Don't appear that way, no. No, they're, they're not waiting for messengers that God will send. They're not looking for any messengers. And, they're and these looking, men, what's that, they're, Kelly? They're actually looking, they're actually looking to, uh, cast them out of the temple. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's because there's a work that God designs that needs to be accomplished and he sends messengers to do it. And the leadership is supposed to work with those messengers. <laughs> Of course, this hasn't happened. Now, this is something that we have to all be aware of because it's easy to look at the church and say, well, the church, you know, has done, you know, not doing anything. It's not looking for new light, but we are. The question is, are we? Are we willing to accept that God can bring messengers whom he, he sent those messengers to accomplish a work that he designs that they should? Does that happen within our movement? You know, because God has sent messengers to this movement and they haven't all been received. Some of them have been cast out and and sometimes for very little things. And sometimes, you know, the messengers that God sends aren't what we expect. So we have to be just as aware of this problem as, as the church should be aware of it. So we never reject light, no matter where it comes from, no matter how how deficient we perceive the messenger to be. If it's light, it's light. So for them, this is about the 1888 message. But let's go on. Let's read what they have to say. They say some very good things in, in their analysis of this. Can there be any question that the message of 1888 was the beginning of that fourth angel's message who joins his voice with the third angel? Now, we, we use the term fourth angel. And I used to always use that term. I actually don't like it because it's actually the second angel. And it's the other angel of Revelation 18, which Ellen White says is the second angel. And so we, we can put it as a fourth way, way mark, you know, first, second and third. And then the fourth is the second. But but, you know, that idea of the fourth angel, um, I, I tried to get that out of my thinking because we need to recognize it's it's the message of the second angel. Babylon is fallen is fallen. But it has the additional message come out of her, my people, which was not really part of the second angel's message, even though it was applied in Millerite history that way. It was incorrect to apply it there because they were also taking the angel of Revelation 18 as the second angel and just giving that as one message. But it wasn't the time for that message yet. So neither the fruitage of spiritual gifts, um, that's by Christian, captains of the host by Spalding. Through Crisis to Victory by Olson, The Lonely Years by Arthur L. White, nor the recent Ellen White statement inserted in Selected Messages, Volume 3, makes a single allusion to this fact. The same is true of the article in the 1888 conference in the spring of 1985, issue of Advent, Adventist Heritage, it's a magazine, uh, which I don't think exists anymore. Our Seventh-day Adventist Encyclopedia discusses the 1888 message in several articles but never recognizes it for what it was. This evasion of vital truth is amazing. It's like the Jews' readiness to acknowledge Jesus of Nazareth as a great rabbi while they evade seeing him as the Messiah. Uh, But logic and consistency require this, this special maneuver by those who insist that the 1888 message was accepted. 
They must virtually ignore the fact that the message was the beginning of the latter reign in the loud cry, or else they must explain how a work which was to have gone like fire in the stubble has been dragging on for nearly a century, when it could have enlightened the world long ago, if our brethren had truly accepted it. So when we were going through the 1893 General Conference Bulletin, H.E. Jones' uh, sermons, he, he addresses this, that, that the mighty angel of Revelation 18 has come down, and we are now on the verge of giving this loud cry. But yet, it never happened. And we can look at this movement at the present time and say, well, we, we've been given all of this light, and we expected things to happen differently than they have. And so one of the things we need to recognize is that uh, the parallel between what happened in 1888 and what's happened in our movement must be evident. Now, when we look at our movement right now, we have lots of different parallels, right? That is, we can look at other lines in the past and they can parallel our line. And so we need to know where in our line we are when we compare it with past histories. Now, one of the comparisons that we've made about our line is that we're in early writings, page 74. So that is, this movement is in a time after the disappointment, and we are sort of the scattered and peeled people, right? And and God's going to uh, gather his people together, right? A second time, right? So we can look at that history. We can say, well, that's where we are. But we can also say, well, we're in 1888 as well, right? We're in a time in which a message came, and that message has not really been heeded. And, and when we do that, we're looking at different aspects of this movement. So one of the things this movement was supposed to recognize is our inefficiencies or deficiencies, right? that we are unprepared for the work that we profess to be doing. And so this work, when, when we talk about a work of repentance that needs to be done, lots of people think we need to repent of July 18, 2020. But we do have a work of repentance to do. It's, it's not to repent of God's leading in the past, to say that it was all a delusion, because there's no parallel to that in Millerite history, except by the, by the, the first day Adventists. So, so we have all of these different parallels, but the work that needs to be done right now is the same work that needed to be done in 1888. So note how clearly Ellen White saw the 1888 message in the light of Revelation 18. Several have written to me inquiring of the 1888 message of justification by faith is the third angel's message, or if the 1888 message of justification by faith is the third angel's message. And I've answered. It is the third angel's message in verity. The prophet declares, and after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. So that's Review and Herald, April 1, 1890. Of course, she's quoting Revelation 18.1. And then November 22nd, 1892, from Review and Herald, the loud cry of the third angel has already begun in the revelation of the righteousness of Christ. This is the beginning of the light of the angels, angel whose glory shall fill the whole earth. So we know that the mighty angel of Revelation 18 coming down is connected to the message of the righteousness of Christ. But we know it's also connected to the Sunday law. And, and of course, they're tied together, right? The, the Sunday law is you know, the mark of the beast and in cont cont contrast, to the mark of the beast is the seal of God, which comes through righteousness by faith. If that wondrous message is to be proclaimed by the popular Protestant revivalists, we have no reason to exist as a people. So one of the things we can see is that this is a message that was given to Seventh-day Adventists. And if, and if it is just the same message that the Protestant revivalists use, there's no reason that the Seventh-day Adventist church should exist, if that's all that message is. And, and for some Adventists, Seventh-day Adventist church is just some other church. It's the one they grew up in. It's the one they prefer. Uh, you know, they like the culture of it. Um, they have positions within the church, and, and their social groups are there. But they don't really think the Adventist church is 
is a special church, God's denominated people or, you know, the remnant, right? It's just one church and all these churches all have things to bring together, but there is really just one Christian church with all of these different parts of the body, right? That's, that's how many Adventists see Seventh-day Adventism today. Our leaders, it's what's being taught in our schools. That's generally the view. Now, there's always people who understand we're peculiar people. There's pastors like that. There's leaders like that. But, but that wouldn't be the most common view. So we can see that there's this light that's supposed to come. And, and here, Whelan and Short don't quite understand it, right? They don't, they wouldn't recognize that this old truths that need to be recovered and replaced in the framework of truth would be something like the 2520, right? Or certain understandings of prophecy. And, and that's one of the problems with what I spent most of my years doing as a Seventh-day Adventist is proclaiming righteousness by faith. You know, I've read this book, I've read Jones and Wagner, all the stuff they had written, and I believed that that was the message that we needed to give, this message of God's love, of his forgiveness, his ability to overcome sin. And those are all important. But if they're not placed, if we don't have the old truths, if we don't have the prophecies, then we have nothing upon which to build our faith other than our own feelings. Now, so this next part, dealing about the light of the loud cry turned off, is something that we also have to really consider. Uh, the Lord is merciful and long-suffering and ready to forgive, and he restores that which was lost on condition of repentance. But we must not allow confusion to neutralize the parable of 1888. If those who opposed the light at Minneapolis later repented truly, and were forgiven, why was not the original purpose of the 1888 message fulfilled? It is certain that there was no revival and reformation consistent in scope and effect with what would have come had the light been accepted. The Lord sent no more light beyond the faith, faithful beginning, and we may ask why. And when we think about the light, now I'm not sure what they're thinking the light would be, um, I mean, they're saying there was no ri- revival and reformation consistent in scope and effect with what would have had had the light been accepted. But the light is not just the light of righteousness of Christ. As we look back at that quote again, let's go back to that quote earlier. If through the grace of Christ, his people will become new bottles, he will fill them with the new wine. God will give additional light. So that can't be just the light of the message of the righteousness of Christ. And old truths will be recovered and replaced in the framework framework of truth. So there's additional light, which would come from the acceptance of the message of the righteousness of Christ. And that new light would be new wine, new teachings, new understandings, which are actually because of the old truths that are recovered and replaced in the framework, framework of truth. Right. So and that's why we need to search the scriptures to seek for the truths that have been hidden beneath the rubbish of error. And so this is the one problem that Adventism has is it's not interested in any of this new light to them. New light, anything they've never heard of before is suspect. Right. And so we can see here. That even Whelan and Short, in using these quotes, don't quite understand what that new light is. At no time between 1888 and 1901 did the responsible leadership of the church manifest a firm purpose to rectify the tragic mistake of 1888. Doubt, suspicion, mistrust of the message, and the messengers continued even for decades. And, and we have to think about that within our movement as well. Doubt, suspicion, mistrust of the message and the messengers. And there's many messengers in this movement. There's many people that God has raised up to give a message, to have insight into things. And what we see is gossip and rumors and uh, attacking people, which is not what we are to do. And we need to look at the light, even if it comes from somebody who in some way appears to be our enemy. If it's light, it's light. 
Although this tragedy occurred, there is no need to conclude that the Lord withdrew his blessings from his people. What was despised and rejected was the latter rain. But the former rain has continued to fall. Unnumbered souls have been led to the Lord um, during the past century, including every reader of this book. Not one person is living today who took part in the 1888 history. God has not forsaken his people, but our attitude tied his hands, making it impossible for him to send any more showers of the latter rain. He could not, would not cast his choicest pearls before those who would not reverence his more abounding grace. Therefore, those showers of the latter rain ceased after the initial outpouring was persistently repulsed. He is not beyond the capacity of being grieved. In a thought-provoking, almost cryptic sermon at Minneapolis, Ellen White spoke of Elijah fed by a widow outside of Israel because those in Israel who had light had not lived up to it. They were the most hard-hearted people in the world, the hardest to impress with the truth, she said. The Syrian Naaman was cleansed from his leprosy, while Israelite lepers remained defiled. When the inhabitants of Nazareth rose up against the son of Mary, some were ready to accept him as the Messiah. But an influence pressed in to counter their conviction. These were illustrations of our 1888 history. But here a state of unbelief arises. Is not this Joseph's son? What did they do in their madness? They rose up and thrust him out of the city. Here I want to tell you what a terrible thing it is if God gives light. And it is impressed in your heart and spirit. Why God will withdraw his spirit unless his truth is accepted. But God was accepted at Nazareth by some. The witness was here that he was God. But a counter influence pressed in that would cause the hearts to disbelieve. So it's manuscript 8, 1888, pages 263, 264. Now I think when it says it's Olson, I think that's in his collection. Anyway, I need to figure that out. I don't quite understand that. But anyway, that, that counter influence is a significant factor in our 1888 history. Two days before, she had warned that the steps of unbelief taken would prove final for that generation so far as advanced light of the latter reign was concerned. We are losing a great deal of blessing we might have had at this meeting, Minneapolis, because we do not take advanced steps in the Christian life as our duty is pre presented before us, and this will be an eternal loss. That light, which is to fill the whole earth with its glory, has been despised by some who claim to believe the present truth. I know not, but some have even now gone too far to return and repent. I guess that'd be, I know not, but some have, so that's how you would say that. Anyway, if you wait for light to come in a way that will please everyone, you will wait in vain. If you wait for louder calls or better opportunities, the light will be withdrawn and you will be left in darkness. So that's, that last one's 5T720, one before testimonies to ministers, 89 and 90, um, 1896, and then this other one from uh, manuscript 8, 1888. <clears throat> Speaking of a meeting of ministers in 1890, Ellen White revealed the pathetic picture of Jesus being turned away as the bride-to-be in the Song of Solomon. 5, verse 2, turned her lover away. Christ knocked for entrance, but no room was made for him. The door was not opened, the light of his glory, so nigh it was withdrawn, under 73, 1890. So we can see that uh, just as light has been rejected in the past, that we also are rejecting light and that we have to learn the lessons of 1888, which is really the lessons of, of the crucifixion, what happened to Christ. Now, um, this next section of the source of reformationist misunderstanding, uh, they say, Earnest efforts for decades to disparage the 1888 message as new light tend to deflect favorable attention from the message itself toward popular non-Adventist 
Protestant concepts. This has been the case for some 60 years, beginning around the 1920s. So they didn't want to accept the 1888 message as new light. It's just old light, right? It's just it's just what's always been taught. It's nothing new. It's just a re-emphasis, right? That's what we've been studying about of how they look at this, that this, the church does. This has been the case for some 60 years, beginning around the 1920s. A.G. Daniels, Christ Our Righteousness of 1926, saw nothing unique in the 1888 message, but mistakenly interpreted it as being in perfect harmony with the best non-Adventist evangelical teaching. Well, that's from a book by Peace, by Faith Alone, which, which I read that book, actually, when I first became an Adventist. Uh, at least part of it. I'm pretty disgusted with, with the book, by the way. Um, now, so the idea, and, and A.G. Daniel's books, book I've read as well, Christ Our Righteousness. So the idea that he saw nothing unique in the 1888 message. So I, I've run into people in this movement uh, when, when I was first in this movement, back in 2012, for instance, when we were at uh, Lillooet, Kelly, do you remember that? I can't remember who the, what the guy's name was, but he was just so just like this book, Christ Our Righteousness by Daniels, is just the best thing. It's like Daniels accepted uh, the 1888 message, right? And he has a lot of things I in remember. there. What's that? I do remember Lillooet. I do remember Lillooet. Is that the fellow that was uh, recommending he was drinking turpentine? No, no. This is just some other. Later on, no wasn't one of the speakers. It's just one of the guys that oh. was there for the meetings. And he was just telling me about this book, Christ Our Righteousness. And I said, you know, it's not, it's not correct. But, but the main thing about it is it's, it's that he doesn't see anything unique, right? So when we just think about righteousness by faith as what the Protestant reformers taught, the 1888 message was something unique because it was in the context of our understanding of the, of the of the heavenly sanctuary, the work that needed to be accomplished before Christ could return and take his people home, something which Protestants don't understand. They just think one day Jesus is going to come back, change their natures, and, and, and because we accepted his forgiveness for our sins in the past, and he, we get new natures, then we're not going to sin anymore, right? They don't like the idea that Christ's character has to be perfectly reproduced in his people. They believe that that's an impossibility. This long tradition has doubtless laid the foundation for the current success of concepts of righteousness by faith, similar to those held by Calvinist reformationist theologians. If non-Adventists possess the truth of unrighteousness by faith, we must, of necessity, import the doctrine from them. But in the process of doing so, the 1888 truths have been neglected and even opposed. Uh, so we could see, well, he's going to say the following is typical, but I would say the attack on what is labeled as last generation theology is the fruit of this. So people like Kelly and I know Dave and Daryl Bodwin, who are pastors, well, they're retired now, who used to be conservative Adventists, believe Jones and Wagner, now say uh, the great danger to the Adventist church is the acceptance of this last generation theology and that, that this is, this is what's hindering the church. But, but that's the exact message that Jones and Wagner give. And it's even understood that way uh, by many of our theologians that Jones and Wagner went too far. Okay. <clears throat> that's what their belief is, but that's really the 1888 message that went too far in, they just don't realize it. The following is typical of this widely held view. It is, it seriously confuses, confuses reformationist views with the 1888 message. Here's an example of the vulnerable foundation on which rests the phenomenal confusion of recent decades. So this is by a guy with his last name's Christian, the fruitage, fruitage of spiritual gifts. The 1888 righteousness by faith was not new light. There are those who have entertained the mistaken idea that the message of righteousness of Christ was an unknown truth to the Advent movement up to the time of the Minneapolis meeting. 
But the fact is that our pioneers taught it from the very beginning of the Advent, Advent Church. As a young preacher, I often heard our veterans, such as J.G. Madison and E.W. Farnsworth, declare that justification by faith was not a new teaching in our church. Sad to say, some of those veterans were not receptive to the increased 1888 light. This insistence that the 1888 message was not new light was the familiar insignia of the opposition of that time. Not long after the Minneapolis meeting, R.F. Cottrell wrote an article for the review attacking the 1888 message, asking, where is the new departure? And that's from Review and Herald, April 22, 1890. W.H. Littlejohn likewise attacked the message with an article January 16, 1894, entitled Justification by Faith, Not a New Doctrine. Both failed to recognize what was happening in their day, the onset of the latter reign. Some writers have cited isolated, rested Ellen White statements in support of the same opposition thesis that it was not new light. But she did not contradict herself on this important point. Let us examine the statements used in support of the re-emphasis view, and we must give them a fair hearing. Elder E.J. Wagner had the privilege at Minneapolis granted him of speaking plainly and presenting his views upon justification by faith and the righteousness of Christ in relation to the law. This was no new light, but it was old light placed where it should be in the third angel's message. This was not new light to me, for it had come to me from higher authority for the last 44 years. So that's manuscript 24, 1888, page 48. Laborers in the cause of truth should present the righteousness of Christ, not as new light, but as precious light that has for a time been lost sight of by the people. Review and Herald, March 20th, 1894. These statements do not say that the 1888 message (coughs) in its fullness was not the new light of the latter reign and the latter cry. In context, the manuscript 24, 1888 statement was written to refute the prejudice of opposing brethren who disparaged the message as merely human novelty. All light is eternal, none is ever strictly new, but it was certainly new to our brethren in 1888 and to our congregations, and it would have been new to the world if we had proclaimed it. And whatever the 1888 light was, new or old, it is obvious that no one else had preached it among us during those last 44 years. Further on in the 1889 manuscript, Ellen White stated that the entire 1888 message would indeed prove to be new light if the gospel commission was to be finished in that generation. Questions were asked at that time. Sister White, do you think that the Lord is any new and increased light for us as a people? I answered most assuredly. I do not only think so, but I can speak understandingly. I know there is precious truth to be unfolded to us if we are the people that are to stand in the day of God's preparation. Seventh-day Adventists are not to cultivate the reputation of being inventors of new doctrines, but repairers of the breach, the restorer of paths to dwell in, the discoverers of the old ways. Such a presentation will disarm prejudice, whereas presenting truth as something newly invented will arouse opposition. But this does not deny that the 1888 message was an advanced revelation to the church. Ellen White's conviction gradually deepened that it was the fulfillment of the Revelation 18 prophecy. She saw how it harmonized with the unique concept of the cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary. This was the genius of the message. This is truth that sincere fellow Protestants have never comprehended. Could one reason be that we have never made it clear to them? It is shocking to Orthodox Jews who have been praying for the coming of their Messiah to realize that he came long ago, but was rejected by their forefathers. It is no less shocking to Seventh-day Adventists who keep praying for the outpouring of the latter rain to realize that the blessing came a century ago, but was rejected by their forefathers. Okay, so any comments on what we've read so far? I think it's it's pretty well understood. 
some people may have comments or questions. Okay, so nobody has any comments? Okay, now we're going to go to chapter six. So I'm going to start on this just because we, we got quite a bit of time. I'm not going to go too far though. I think, I think I'll probably just finish in at eight o'clock. Now, when we think about, uh, the rejection of the message, why was Ellen White also rejected? That's kind of what this is going to, to be addressing. She was rejected by the leadership because they felt that she was giving support to Jones and Wagner and had departed from what she had said before. Okay. Now, did the rejection of Ellen White just begin at 1888, or had it been going on for a long time? Well, it had been going on since the death of her husband. Right. Now, it was probably seeds of it were... Or, because six seeds of it were brewing, but that's the mixed metaphor. I don't know. Um, it had been brewing, but underneath things while James White was alive. Well, they had a, they had a time period there for a couple of years before he died that they had separated. And yeah. throughout this, there had been a lot of issues, especially those that had been fomented by Uriah Smith. Right. So, so there is, there's stuff going on before 1888, even before James White dies. Right. That, that is going to then become manifest at the 1888 General Conference. Now, within this movement, we have had very similar things happen. Right. That's one of the things that we, and, and, and it's not to sort of, criticize individuals because we don't know individuals' hearts. But we do know what ended up happening with the December 6, 2020 declaration. So when we have the leadership at that time of FFA, mostly led by Broadway, which also had Larry Hine and, and uh, the other people, I can't think of their names, um, Larry Lesher and... Uh, e. McCone. Yeah. So, so you had, you had this, this opposition that showed up, but that opposition was always there. Now, it wouldn't have been evident to everyone until things came to the, you know, to where they came to. But I was aware of it. And, and the reason I was aware of it is I was affected by all of this opposition. Now, in some ways, I'm thankful for it. You know, I never became officially a part of FFA. You know, I wasn't, I wasn't even officially picked as a teacher. I just somehow, Jeff liked me and he would have me present things. But, but you know, I was never under the payroll of FFA. I was never a part of their organization. I was just, you know, really a nobody in the movement. And for whatever reason, that people have, whether it's jealousies, different things. Uh, there was a lot of people who didn't like the fact that Jeff listened to me. And so they would try to do things to undermine uh, me as an individual so that Jeff wouldn't listen to me. I know Tabo was one of them, um, but there was others. Even Parminder was doing that, which I wasn't aware of. Um, so... So those types of things happen, and then they become manifest at some point in time. But there was always this opposition to the work that I was doing in FFA. And I'm not paralleling myself you know, to Jones or Wagner or anything like that, um, because other people were also treated that way. We saw that with Chawatu. We saw it with Mark Bruce. And, and all of us, and I would include myself, we all have deficiencies. We all have things that people could readily crit criticize about our characters. Now, this opposition to Ellen White, uh, I mean, she's definitely uh, a very godly woman. Um, she doesn't, she's, she's very dependent upon God. God is speaking to her directly and she is the spirit of prophecy. She is she is writing the testimonies. She's given this message from God. She's a prophet. 
right? Something that I'm not or any of these other people we mentioned are. So, but yet that opposition still manifested itself. And in some ways, we can all say that if we have a message that God gives us, we are messengers. We may not be prophets, but the message that's given should not be rejected just because we have problems with the person's personality or how they present themselves or um, we think that they're unfit in some other way uh, because we're more fit, you know, or they're not part of the leadership or they've never been accepted. All these different reasons that people have. Now with Ellen White, uh, what was the main reason that people rejected the spirit of prophecy? If anybody knows this history, what was, and when I say the reason, I mean the real reason, not the reasons that are given. I mean, we could include those. But why did people reject the spirit of prophecy? Why do they reject the testimonies? If I'm right, I believe it was because she gave the straight testimony personally to people and it was causing them to have a convictions of conscience. Yeah. People don't want to change. When a message comes from God that there is a problem, people often don't want to receive it. I mean, we've all experienced this. Somebody coming to us and rebuking us in some way, saying, you know, I see how you're raising your children or whatever it is, or I see this thing in your character that's, that's uh, you know, that's bothering them or something. And, and we generally don't receive it very well. Right? Nobody likes to be criticized. And Ellen White is, is, in a sense, criticizing. She's giving counsel, and sometimes it's a rebuke. But she's doing it in a way that, that is meant to be restorative. But it doesn't mean that people are going to necessarily like it. And some people uh, that she's going to write lots of rebukes to who never listen are then going to find reasons to reject Ellen White. And so that <clears throat> what's brewing underneath all of this is it going to explode in this, not just a rejection of the message, but in outward opposition to the spirit of prophecy. And um, so anyway, we're going to, we're going to just read a little bit of this to get this started. Uh, what Ellen White says about the reaction against the 1888 message sounds almost incredible. Could it be that a natural born unbelief veils our eyes and heart? And that's what we would have to say. Men love darkness, right? We're in darkness. We humans seem to have difficulty believing the testimony of Jesus. What was a defeat? What was a defeat we like to call a glorious victory? Where we lost our way, we assume that we found it. We must clarify hazy, indistinct impressions to as near pinpoint accuracy as possible. Several avenues of heaven's blessings were blocked by the negative reaction toward the 1888 message. The inhabitants of heaven already realize what we did in that history as follows. <clears throat> this may sound impossible for several reasons. The Holy Spirit was insulted. Um, it may be difficult for us to readily, for us readily to conceive of the Holy Spirit as a person who can be insulted or who can feel it and be concerned about it. And it may be even more difficult to conceive of how Seventh-day Adventists could do such a thing, certainly not ministers and general conference leaders. But we must face what the Lord Messenger has to say. The testimony of Jesus does not gloss over reality. Now our meeting is drawing to a close and there has not been a single break so as to let the Spirit of God in. Now I was saying, what was the use of our assembling here together for our ministering brethren to come in if they are here only to shut out the Spirit of God from the people? That's manuscript 9, 1888. There was, I knew, a remarkable blindness upon the minds of many at Minneapolis so that they did not discern where the Spirit of God was and what constituted true Christian experience, and to consider that these were the ones who had the guardianship of the flock of God was painful. Our brethren who have occupied leading positions in the work and the cause of God should have been so closely connected with the source of all light 
that they would not call light, light darkness and darkness light. Manuscript 24, 1888. <clears throat> the details of this history are precise and clear cut. There's no confusion. There need be no confusion in our thinking regarding intangibles. The reception of the Holy Spirit was implicit in the reception of the message itself. It would be impossible to receive a latter rain gift of the Holy Spirit and not receive the message through which the gift was given. And the good news that we today need to grasp is the call corollary of this truth. It is equally impossible to receive the message today and not receive the gift of the Holy Spirit implicit with it. If we have not received the Holy Spirit in the power of the latter rain and the loud cry, this is clear evidence that we have not received the message that the Lord sent us, sent to us. Now, a comment about this. So people have a misconception about reception of the Holy Spirit. We know that the Holy Spirit inspired God's word and that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation for holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. In order to understand God's word, we need the Holy Ghost. So anybody who is studying God's word and receiving that light is receiving the Holy Ghost through God's word. Right? That's that's how we would understand it. So obviously, if we're rejecting light, we're rejecting the Holy Spirit. And if we're receiving light, we're receiving the Holy Spirit, whatever that light is you know, from God. What is important in understanding 1888 is not the negative attitude of a few individuals, a so-called diehard minority, but the spirit which controlled or prevailed at the 1888 conference and thereafter. This is what had a determinative effect on that generation and has had on every generation since. Ellen White is clear about the controlling influence. So, I'm going to stop there, and we're going to come back to this next Friday night, and we'll review that a little bit. But we need to recognize in ourselves, are we receptive to light? Because if we're not receptive to light, there's no point to even studying God's word if we're not going to receive it. And, and that's one of the reasons we pray before we study. We ask God to soften our hearts, to have us open to things that we wouldn't naturally be open to because those things are going to bring a conviction. <coughs> so any final thoughts before we close with prayer? Okay. Dear father in heaven, thank you for the study here this evening. We pray for your spirit to continue to plead with us, to show us our need of you. We ask for forgiveness for our sins, for our neglect. And we ask that you can work upon our behalf, even if it doesn't feel like it. We know, Lord, that you have a purpose. So we leave all things in your hands, and we ask that this Sabbath can truly be a blessing to each one of us. And we pray for the studies tomorrow morning as well, um, that they will be a blessing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.